All right. First of all, I want to say thank you guys for letting me hang out with you this week. This is the last chapel where I get to speak to you, so thanks for listening. Thanks for asking some good questions. Thanks for interacting, thinking, discussing, looking cool. All helpful things. I appreciate that, and I know that... Oh, young Marine. Um, we have had a cool week together, meaningful time together, and I want to encourage you guys, whether or not you're going home at the end of this week or staying on, to... Take seriously the fact that God is working and speaking in your life, and regardless of what happens around you, you can be a person who seeks the Lord. So today, we're going to jump in and look at uh, a passage in Luke 15. So if you have a Bible and you want to open it up, we're going to look at Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And while you're looking that up, I'm just going to remind you, this whole week we've been talking about how when God gives us truth, it changes our minds, and our minds change our hearts, and our hearts change what we do, change our will. So the truth that we believe changes what we love, and what we love changes what we do. And we've been talking about this a lot, and today I'm just going to aim straight for your mind. And when I say I, what I really mean is I'm going to share some things from God's Word and like we talked about earlier this week, God's Word is sharp, it's alive, it's active, and it can make a difference in your life. And so I'm going to just try to aim what God has said at your mind. And hopefully it'll, it'll make an impact. I want to encourage you guys to listen. Some of you look really tired, and that's okay. Um, God can work in your life even when you're sleepy. And I know a lot about being sleepy. I'm an excellent sleeper. But God, God can wake us up to who he is and to what he's doing. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump in. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak. We pray that you'd help us to listen. Change our minds today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 15. Starting in verse 11, this is a very famous passage, and we're going to just go section by section straight through. Starts out saying this, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, we'll pause there for a second and just say, there are a lot of Christians where this part of the story is very appealing to you, where there's a desire to say, I've been sort of sheltered, and I've been in the bubble, and I don't know what the world is really like, and I would really love to be like, give me half of your money, parents, and I'm going to go out there and do whatever I want. Um, and it's not just marginal Christians. I'm talking about people who are in Christian schools or homeschooled, people who go to church, people who come to Chehi, have a great summer, and then head out with the intention of going into a distant country for wild living. And this is a trap. I'm going to talk about a couple traps today, but uh, this trap comes from broken thinking. So this son is living with, with his father, and he thinks the wrong thing, so he loves the wrong thing, so he does the wrong thing. Now, we've been talking about that all week, but if you look at it, he says, I think that if I don't have my dad, but I have my dad's money, if I have this belief, that what I can get is going to be better than what I have here. And what it looks like out there looks pretty good, and what I love is things that are pretty good. So I want to get out there and pursue what I love. And we talked earlier this week about how we all are people who pursue what we love. We mostly do what we want. And when we sin, sometimes we try to over-spiritualize it, but when we give in to sin, it's usually because we want that sin. And so he believed some wrong things, he loved some wrong things, and then he said, Dad, give me that money, and then he did some wrong things. But we're going to keep going. After this son had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, you might notice here the life that looked so good when he was at home was not looking so good anymore. What looked so good from far away when he experienced it up close wasn't what he thought. He was probably thinking, I didn't really sign up to say, Dad, give me half of your money so I can wish I could eat what pigs would eat. That wasn't the plan. It didn't play out the way that he thought it would, which means what was in his mind, what he believed, what he thought, wasn't true. And that's often what leads us into sin. When we love the wrong things, it's often because we have believed the wrong things. Pig feeding was not his picture of a good time. It was not his picture of a good life. And so this, this road that he thought was going to lead to happiness and satisfaction was going somewhere, but it wasn't going where he wanted it to go. And I want to challenge you guys to think about this. There are things that our culture, our world, even some of your friends and peers and people around you say are going to be satisfying and meaningful in your life. They're going to say, it's going to be better to do this than follow Jesus. It's going to satisfy you more to do this than to do what Jesus calls you to do. But those things weren't satisfying when Jesus was telling this story, and they're not satisfying now either. Life apart from the Father always leads to emptiness, always leads to emptiness, always leads to emptiness, always leads to emptiness. And yet, we see students, you might know some, um, maybe people a little bit older than you, who are longing to leave the Father's house and get out there and see what the world has to offer. But sin and selfishness always leave you hungry always leave you lonely, always leave you broken. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. It keeps going. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. And we're going to pause here again. This is a good moment for us to notice in our study this week. He came to his senses. Man, that's beautiful. It can be really challenging when we come to our senses because a lot of times we realize we're on the wrong path, doing the wrong thing, or doing the wrong thing in the wrong way at the wrong time with the wrong people. But when we come to our senses, we understand the truth. He came to his senses in his mind. He, he learned the truth in his mind. He said, you know, my father's servants have it better than me. So I understand a true thing, that life with my father is better than this life that I was living out here. And the true thing that he believed in his mind ended up changing where he walked with his feet. And we're going to get to that more in a second. But this is how life change happens. And you can't, I hope you cannot forget it now that we've talked about it so much. So let's do our little thing. All right, so what we believe with our mind changes our heart, which changes our will. And that's what happened here. He all of a sudden came to his senses. He understood something in his mind, and it changed him. And so he turned his life around. Let's keep reading. But while he was still a long way off, so between the last section and while he was still a long way off, he probably had come a long way back. You think? He had, turned, he had turned around. And the word repentance in the Bible really has two meanings that people often talk about. It means to change your mind, and it means to turn around. And some people will ask me, huh, does it mean to change your mind or to turn around? And the truth is, they're actually the same thing. That if you're going somewhere and then you change your mind about going there, what are you going to do? Turn around. And so repentance does mean to turn around. You're going one way, you're pursuing sin, and then you're like, oop, nope, not going to pursue sin, I'm going to go the other way. But what makes you turn around is that you change your mind. And what changes your mind is a true understanding of who God is, what he has done, and what that means for us, the truth changes us. So while he was a, still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. 
The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. We want to note a few things here. The father saw him when he was far away. He didn't say, like, get over here and, like, pay me back my money. But the father accepted him back, ran to him, hugged him, kissed him, was excited for him. But the the son was still in the middle of his spiel. And he starts saying exactly what he had practiced ahead of time. And so he gets into his little conversation that he's saying, he's saying, I have sinned, father. I am not worthy to be your son anymore, father. He's, he's getting into telling his story, and he's going about to say, you know, I want to be a servant in your house because I'm not worthy, because I've done wrong, because I've thrown everything away. But the father doesn't see it that way because of one simple truth, that sons are not servants. Let's keep reading. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You see, the son was coming back and he's saying, Dad, you probably don't like me anymore because I really messed up and I'm not worthy to be called your son. And what the dad said was, you know, being my son is not based on what you can do for me. It's based on who you are to me. Did the son sin? Did he do something evil? Did he go against his father? Yes. But sonship is not based on actions. It's based on the reality of what it means to be in a family. If you talk to some of these um, faculty members and staff people who have uh, young kids around, uh, the young kids are adorable and cute when you see them. But they actually, um, no offense small people, don't contribute a lot of what would be perceived as value. They don't com- you know, contribute to the gross domestic product of that family very much. They're consumers, not producers. And so they consume food and money and clothing and all that they produce. Well, we won't talk about what they produce. <laughs> but, um, but they are loved and cherished and cared for because they're in the family, not because of what they can do for their family. Do you guys understand the difference? Your parents don't love you because of how you perform. They don't love you because of what you provide. They love you because you are theirs. Do you hear what I'm saying? And in this story, the father says to his son, I don't love you because you're a good son. I love you because you're my son. And that's a huge difference. Babies, kids, young people can't do one thing that's good, meaningful, powerful, helpful to the parent, but they're loved and they're cared for just because of who they are. Just because of who they are. And I want to point out something in this story. What really hurt in this relationship and the root of this unrighteousness that the son pursued was not necessarily that he was promiscuous or engaged in being drunk or wild living or things like that. The real sin was before that, and it happened in his mind, and it was when he decided to leave. It was when he decided to leave. He said to his dad that he wanted out, he wanted freedom, he wanted to do his own thing. And I want to tell you, if you look at God and say, God, you're cool and everything, but I'm going to walk away from you and do my own thing, it doesn't matter what your own thing is. If your thing is not his thing, it's not the right thing. And so the real sin of, of unrighteousness, the problem that this first son has, is he'd, he went and did these wrong things, and yes, they were wrong, but the root of what was wrong was how he was thinking about his father. He thought, living with my father is holding me back. Living with my father is keeping me from being happy. Living with my father is keeping me from being satisfied in everything I wanted to be. And he got out there, and he re- realized he was so wrong. So, for you good little boys and girls... If you don't do any of the wild living, if you're not promiscuous, if you don't go out and get drunk, if you're very different looking than the world, but you have left God, it's just the same. Because the sin isn't always what you do after you leave. The big problem is the leaving. So it doesn't exactly matter what keeps you absent from the Father. It could be 
so, uh, unrighteousness like this, or it could be self-righteousness like the other brother. And we're going to look at him right now. So let's keep reading. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Man, he was working hard. When we see him for the first time, everybody's partying and he's out there in the field. It's like some of you guys who are like, they're out there playing frisbee, but I bet I could sneak back into a practice room and do some work. And, um, and that's, it's good to work hard and everything like that. But this son was, he was all about the work, it looks like. So when this son came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Man, he should have been like, oh, what's going on in here? It's going to be a party. There's a fatted calf over there about to get me some. But he, he was not excited like that. He wasn't doing that. He, he called one of the servants over, and he did not say, bring me some fatted calf, my man. What he said was, what is going on here? What is going on here? And the servant says, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, if this happens in your family, just like this is a tip for you, take this one. Love your brothers and your sisters. Care about your peeps. If they come home, you should be like, hey, what's going on? So glad you're here. Hug them. But the older son didn't do that. It says the older son became angry and refused to go in. Now, we can tell that there's something going on here. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But this son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Yikes. So this is the second trap. The first trap is unrighteousness, and it starts in your mind, and it's saying, life would be better if I was farther away from God. But this is the second trap, and it's called self-righteousness, and it says, life is better because of the work I'm doing for God. That if I perform in the right way, if I'm God's servant, if I work for him and do all the right stuff, and everything lines up in my life, if I'm a good person, God is going to be so happy with me, and when I get to heaven, like, he's going to cover me in gold stars. And that that is a real trap for people in an environment like this, where you think if you're a good rule follower, you're a Christ follower. That is not the same thing. He didn't understand, this son did not understand that he was not a servant, he was a son. See, he had made a trade. The first son said, I'm leaving home to get out of here. The second son stayed home. The older son, he stayed home, but he left already in his heart because he said, I'm not a son. I'm a servant. You're not my dad. You're my boss. And he says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. How did he think of himself as a worker? How did he talk about his relationship with his dad? Did he say, I love you, dad? No. He said, I work for you, dad. Something was wrong there. He thought that working for the father and doing all the right stuff was the solution to being who his father wanted him to be. The younger son wanted to come back as a lowly servant, but the older son had been a servant the whole time. The older son had been a servant the whole time because he had viewed himself as a servant. This older son, he was doing all the right things. He was probably standing up and sharing at the same time. He's probably carrying around a Bible that was a little bit bigger than everybody else's, quoting a verse or two. You know, he could, you know, sing all the right harmonies to all the songs. Um, he always seemed to put his hand up at the right time and act the right way and never got on anybody's nerves or something like that. He was good in his own eyes, but let me tell you, he was mad about his son or his brother coming back because grace looks gross to people who don't think they need it. And he thought he was already good because of the work he did instead of recognizing that he was good because he was accepted as a son of the father. But once again, he needed to see. Sonship has nothing to do with earning it. So let's keep reading. Verse 31. My son, said the father, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel. This is what it is, that God accepts you into his family because he adopts you, because he brings you in, because he draws you to himself, because he cares about you. 
You are not in God's family because you're so good that he was like, that's my first round draft pick. I really need that person. He doesn't need us. He, he doesn't. He does everything for us. And if you think that by acting the right way and being so good that you can somehow earn status with God, you'll always be stuck feeling like a servant when he wants you to be a son. It's not about doing all the right things. It's about being a child of God. And so these are the two traps. Both of them are empty. Both of them will harm you. Both of them will hurt you. Both of them will leave you with nothing left. And both sins are crouching at your door all the time. You have the opportunity to think that if you act the right way, God will be pleased with you. And you have also the opportunity to think that um, there is more satisfaction far away from Christ than there is close to him. But let me tell you, there, a wise person is a person who learns from his mistakes, but the wisest person is a person who learns from other people's mistakes. And I want to encourage you to learn from the mistakes of these two sons. The first son settled for half of what the father had. Do you remember in the beginning of the passage? He said, Dad, give me my portion. When the dad was saying, everything I have is yours. And the second son settled for living with the father, but instead of being a son, chose to be a servant and missed out on all the privileges and the joy of belonging to the family. And it's quite possible that you've fallen into these traps too. You may be living sinfully right now. Maybe people know it. Maybe they don't. You might have traded your sonship for servanthood, where you feel like your relationship with God is totally dependent on how hard you work and whether or not you're doing the right stuff. I've fallen into those traps many times. But the good news is not just good news when you became a Christian. The good news is good news for all of us right now. And I want to tell you why, and that's because there's actually a third son that we see in this passage. We had the younger son who ran away. We had the older son who was thinking of himself as a servant instead of a son. But there's actually a third son in this story, and the parable doesn't mention the third son, but he's present the whole time because he's the one telling the story. The third son in our story, and in our interaction with God, is Jesus himself. It's Jesus who calls us and empowers us to come to our senses. He's the one who wakes us up. He's the one who gives truth to our minds. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance so that we can make up our minds and turn around. The third son is the solution. Think about what Jesus has done. He rescues us from the, the trap of self-righteousness. Because you cannot think you are a good person when you look at Christ. You cannot think you have earned it. You cannot think you have done right. When you stand in the presence of his holiness, when you consider his glory, you cannot stand there being like, I'm pretty good. Because he is just too glorious, too perfect for us to be able to do that. Closeness with Christ, the third son, kills our self-righteousness. But he also saves us from our unrighteousness because he took all of our sin on himself and he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. This is good news. This is good news for each of us. And when I talk about Jesus and you think about what this son has done in obedience to the Father and for the joy sent before him, he didn't consider equality with God as something he had to like cling on to, but instead left the perfection of heaven and came to a broken world, lived in a broken person's body, but yet experienced all temptation and never gave in to any sin, lived the perfect life that you and I could never live, and yet he died a criminal's death on the cross that each one of us deserved, rose from the dead, proving that anyone who chooses to believe in him can live forever with him, adopted into his family, See, this son is different. The first two sons, the older son and the younger son, we can see some things about ourselves, but this third son is our superhero. He's our, our rescuer. He's the one who reaches out and comes to get us, and he changes everything. And one of the most amazing things about what the Bible teaches is God is not only our father, but Jesus is our brother. Jesus, the third son, is the true firstborn son. The solution from the two traps so let me challenge you this way. 
Hebrews 2.11 says this, The one who makes you holy. Who is that? Who makes us holy? Jesus. The one who makes you holy, that's Jesus. And those who are made holy. Who's that? Us. That's good news. So, the one who makes you holy, Jesus, and the ones who are made holy, that's us, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. How awesome is that? That you have a father in heaven who has done everything for you, and you have older brother Jesus who's saying, I want you in my family. And when you come home and you repent of your sins, he's not saying, what the deal? What, what's up with this fatted calf? He's celebrating. He's jumping in. He's saying, welcome back. Because he didn't just say, I hope you come back soon. He came out and got us. He pulled us out of the pig food. He cleaned us up. He carried us back. He's done everything for us in the gospel. I love this. So I'd encourage you to keep these two traps in mind, the trap of unrighteousness, the appeal of sin, because it comes from lies in your mind, but also the trap of self-righteousness, the appeal of thinking that you can earn, earn God's satisfaction in you. But most of all, I want to encourage you to cling to Jesus because we believe that we don't save ourselves, but he saves us. He's not just waiting for you to turn around and hoping, crossing his fingers, saying, please, 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 I hope it works out. He comes to get us. He comes to rescue us. He lifts us up out of the pit when there is no way that we could get out. And you guys need to understand that this is what the gospel is. The gospel is not. Your parents are good people, so you better be a good person too because Jesus likes that. The gospel is not. You can come around and, and, you know, turn back to Jesus after you've experienced all the good things that the world has to offer. The gospel is this. Jesus is better. Jesus came to get you. And Jesus will satisfy you. And if in your life you are struggling in any way, whether it's with self-righteousness or unrighteousness, thinking you got it all together or pursuing sin, if sin has a hold on you, or your heart is hard, I want to encourage you guys today to, to speak to me or speak to one of your counselors or to one of the faculty members because the concert tonight is really important. But everyone here will agree that they would much rather have you squeak on your clarinet tonight and sing perfectly in heaven forever. True? Let's pray. God, you are good, and we thank you that you pursue us. We thank you for sending your Son, not just to reach out to us, but to come get us. And I pray for these students, for those who are wrestling with sin. God, bring them to their senses. Wake up their minds. I pray for the students here who think that they need to perform for you so that you're happy with them. Show them your grace. Show them the good news that you are perfect and it's your righteousness that makes them perfect. And I pray that you would show each of us fresh again that the good news is that you are good, not that we have to be good for you. Draw us into close relationship with you. Work in our lives. And we thank you that that is what you do, and that is what you do so well. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.